the strongest god pretends to be a weak student and joins a fighting tournament. Mori is a young disgusting and useless orphan boy who was adopted by an old man. This old man raised him in the mountains while teaching his unique and special martial art called Renewal Taekwondo. But one day, his grandfather told Mori it was time to join a school in the city, study hard, and make some friends. Mori felt very sad and was left in tears. But in reality, he knew the old man just wanted to buy milk and never come back. We then see three men relaxing on a beach, getting massages from girls, something you won't ever have. One of them called a government worker named Park, inquiring about the bill they had sent to the National Assembly. The man offered him money, but the men were beyond that. They discussed their plan to harm the reputation of the country's prime minister. As they chatted, something approached the island. Suddenly, a strong wind blew, and the clouds quickly covered the sunny sky. The three men were uncertain about what to do when something fell from the sky and crushed them. Meanwhile, in an office, a man made a crushing motion with his hand. He then informed his secretary that they were running out of time and needed to start. He has a red cross tattooed on his hand. Later, helicopters arrived at the island to investigate the incident and found a massive hand-shaped print that had a cross on it, just like the one tattooed on the man's hand. We now see Mori, who's now a teenager. He wakes up from a dream about his grandfather's departure. He gazed at a photo of him and his grandfather but then realized he was running late for an important event that day. He hurriedly left on his bicycle, feeling frustrated for oversleeping on such a significant day. Later, on the news, it was announced that today marked the first day of a martial arts tournament known as the God of High School. Students from all over the country could participate, and the city preliminaries were going to be held at the arena. We could see that all the kids were excited about the tournament and wanted to get tickets to watch it. Following this, we saw a guy working in a store. While taking out the trash, he checked his wallet and realized he didn't have enough money. He knew he needed to work more shifts to make ends meet. We see a girl who needs to get to the tournament and asks some martial artists for directions who were not selected for the tournament. While they give her directions, she becomes excited by the guy's muscles. Mori was on his way to the tournament, feeling really hungry and thinking about what he could have for lunch. Just then, he nearly got into an accident with a thief on a motorcycle who snatched an old lady's purse. In that moment, he saw the struggles in the old lady's life, and it made him feel sorry for her. So, he decided to turn around and chase after the thief. The chase was chaotic. Mori was on a bicycle while the thief sped away on a motorcycle. But Mori had some tricks up his sleeves. He expertly changed lanes, almost flying on his bicycle. During the pursuit, he accidentally ran into a girl who was still admiring the artist's muscles. He quickly apologized and resumed chasing the thief. However, when the girl realized her glasses were broken, she got angry and hurled her sword at Mori. She warned him that he wouldn't get away. Mori explained that he was chasing the thief who had stolen the old lady's purse. Hearing this, the girl was moved and decided to help him. They both rode on the bicycle together, determined to catch the thief. The thief did his best to escape, but Mori and the girl pursued him relentlessly. However, when the girl leaped to attack the thief with her sword, she accidentally hit a street sign. At that moment, a passing boy who worked at the store intervened. He stopped the thief with a single powerful punch, leaving both Mori and the girl impressed. In the next scene, the martial arts tournament was about to begin, and we learned that the three of them were in the same dressing room, getting ready to participate. The girl, Yumira, asked Mori to pay for her broken glasses, but Mori insisted it was the thief's fault. He did thank them for saving his life, though. Mori introduced himself as Jin Mori, and the boy, Han Diwi, said his name. They exchanged introductions. Then, the announcer explained the tournament rules. He mentioned that any fighting style was allowed during the matches, there was no time limit, and participants could use any type of weapon. The only ways to win were by knocking out the opponent or getting them to surrender. The regional preliminaries were currently happening, and from there, participants for the main tournament would be selected. The announcer also talked about the bracelets they were all wearing which monitored their vital signs. These bracelets were there to determine if fighters were seriously injured. And if so, the nanomachines injected into them would heal their injuries immediately. The announcer went on to explain that whoever passed all the rounds and won the tournament could make any wish to the organization. With all the fighters gathered, he declared that the fight had begun. Initially, everyone, including the audience, was shocked, but they quickly realized that it was a battle royal. 
some fighters quickly realized that the bracelets not only monitored their life signs but also indicated their fighting levels. As a result, they began targeting the weaker participants, demonstrating the different abilities of each fighter. However, it became evident that Mori was incredibly strong as he effortlessly defeated several opponents. Similarly, Dewey and Mira also proved their skills by defeating numerous participants. Afterward, a fighter named Kang Mansiok entered the ring, and the blue-haired woman mentioned that he was the favorite to win the tournament. Kang started easily defeating several fighters, showcasing his speed, even without using his arms. He expressed disappointment at the fighter's weakness and stated his preference for going back to sleeping in his prison cell. Yumira stepped up to challenge Kang, but her blows didn't do much damage, although she proved to be a formidable opponent. During the fight, Kang made inappropriate comments about her beauty and asked her out, to which Yu responded with disgust. Behind Kang, we saw Mori pulling down his pants, revealing animal print underwear. This surprised Kang, who responded by delivering a powerful kick to Mori's chest, sending him flying. Dewey noticed that when Kang kicked him, Mori took the opportunity to injure Kang's foot with his arm. Mori then stood up and told Kang that if he used all his strength, he would do the same. They both leaped to attack each other. Meanwhile, officials from the United States government grew concerned upon seeing images of the events that took place on the island. A man with a scar on his forehead entered the room, causing everyone to point their weapons at him. The officials asked about his identity, and he introduced himself as Park Mugen, explaining that he worked for the Korean government. The first round of the tournament came to an end. Yu walked ahead to go home, and Jin and Han followed, as they were all heading in the same direction. Their houses were along the same route. Jin asked Yu why she had hit him, which led to the revelation of what had happened during the fight between Jin and Kang. Yu remembered that when she had jumped to attack Kang, she accidentally twisted Jin's neck. She explained that it was not intentional. She had confused him because she wasn't wearing her glasses. However, she mentioned that they were able to heal him using nanomachines that had been injected into all the fighters. These nanomachines could repair all the damage incurred during the fights, leaving Han impressed by the organization's advanced technology. Later, Jin revealed that he was participating in the tournament because he wanted to face many opponents and become stronger. He then asked Han why he was taking part, and Han responded that it was for the money. Finally, Yu mentioned that she was fighting to reclaim her family's martial arts academy. Jin teased her, wondering how people could easily snatch her sword from her, to which she responded that it was because she had no glasses on. Jin took out her sword without her noticing, and she asked for it back. However, as she reached for the sword, it slipped from her grasp and fell into the river. Jin apologized and said he would retrieve it, but she slapped him and asked him to disappear from her sight. It was nighttime, and Mira was searching in the water for her sword. She heard her father's voice, reminding her never to let their moonlight sword style fade away. She had a childhood memory of her father giving her the sword and telling her to find a strong successor for the academy. As she grew up, while other girls enjoyed typical girly activities, she only had time for training and fulfilling her father's wishes. Back in the present, her phone's flashlight suddenly went out, leaving her in darkness. Jin Mori appeared with a flashlight to help her search for the sword. As they continued their search, she apologized for slapping him. When he had taken the sword, she had felt very sad since it was the only memento of her father. Suddenly, Han appeared with bright lights to assist them in finding the sword. The next day, a new round of fights was about to begin, and whoever won would be able to participate in the National God of High School tournament. They introduced a fighter named Gogamdo, who practiced the Tai Chi style. The three of them waited their turn in the locker room. Jin Mori was asleep when Kang approached him and threatened to harm him, even though Mori was asleep. However, Go stepped in and told Kang to leave him alone. Despite this, Kang kicked Go in the face, but Jin Mori quickly woke up and supported Go's back to protect him. Mori advised Go to always stay alert. The first match was between Yu Mira and Han Dichol, and with just one move, she knocked him out. After that, the fights began, and Jin Mori easily won his match. Afterwards, they watched the other participants' fights on TV, and Han also defeated his opponent. Seeing this, Jin Mori expressed his desire to fight them. Suddenly, Gogamdo appeared to thank Jin Mori for intervening when Kang attacked him earlier. He mentioned that he shouldn't have let his guard down. However, as he was saying this, the announcer called the fighters for the next match. Jin Mori warned Go to be careful since his opponent was Kang. Go told Mori that he didn't fear Kang, but he was concerned about losing the battle of wills. The announcer had declared that the fight would not end until one of them became unconscious or surrendered. 
He had also mentioned that if someone left the ring for more than 20 seconds, they would be disqualified, and they could rely on nano machines to heal their injuries. Though had told Kang to release his arms and stay true to the path of a real martial artist. The fight began, and Go managed to land many punches on Ken, impressing Jin Mori and Yu with his technique. Then, he skillfully threw Kang into the audience, leaving everyone astonished. However, Kang returned to the ring slowly and seemed undamaged by Go's punches. Kang then freed one of his arms and began repeatedly striking Go. However, it became clear that Kang's fighting style allowed for anything, including eye gouges and low blows, as it was created for survival and war. At this point, Go believed that his Tai Chi style was about finding peace and not getting angry. He managed to land a powerful blow called the Yin Yang Balance Strike on Kang, but Kang effectively blocked it. Kang then demanded that Go surrender by making him apologize, and he started slapping him to humiliate him. However, Go refused to give in. Kang continued to step on his face and then tried to tear Go's arms from his body. But just as he was doing so, Jin Mori intervened and began hitting Kang because he despised his dirty fighting style. The tournament organizers surrounded Jin Mori and informed him that he couldn't interfere in the fight that way. Kang got back on his feet and claimed that he was no longer the same. A black aura emanated from Kang, and he removed his heavy pants. We caught a glimpse of his past when he was weak and had asked his mentor to teach him techniques, but she had called him a failure. Returning to the present, Kang attacked Jin Mori with a powerful move. The organizers moved to intervene, but Jin Mori jumped and kicked Kang several times. He kicked Kang so many times that Kang fell unconscious. Suddenly, Park Mujin, the man with the scar on his forehead, appeared and used his power to throw Jin Mori to the ground. Over the microphone, he announced that he was the head of tournament administration, and a severe punishment would be imposed on Jin Mori. However, as they were taking him away, he heard the crowd praising and shouting his name. Following that, we observe a group of people dressed in religious robes within a cult-like setting. They are listening to the tournament's events on the radio, and one of them mentions that they will fulfill God's will, believing that by doing so, they will have their wishes granted. Back at the arena, the organizers have gathered, and the woman with blue hair mentions that Gogamdo is severely injured, which means he is eliminated from the tournament. Then, we see Kang, who is quite scared of what Jin Mori did to him. The woman comments that she doesn't believe Kang will fight again. Next, we see Jin Mori working out in his room, while the organizers are debating whether they should disqualify him. The man with the scar on his forehead looks at Jin Mori's record and is surprised to see that Jin Mori's grandfather is Jin Tijin. After that, the fights began. Yu faced off against a woman named Ma Misiyan, who happened to be the United States wrestling champion. Ma suggested that you should choose a different weapon since her wooden sword wouldn't stand a chance. She started the fight strong, attacking you with her aggressive moves. Ma explained that she had come all the way from America to win the tournament, as the winner could have any wish granted. Yu attempted to fight back with her sword, but Ma's strength seemed as tough as iron, making her attacks ineffective. Yu's sword ended up falling far away, and Ma taunted her, claiming that she had no chance of winning. This infuriated Yu and she unleashed a power called the Moonlight Sword Style, which created a large wound on Ma's chest. Even without her sword, Ma fell to the ground, and Yu was declared the winner. Meanwhile, Jin Mori was in the room celebrating Yu's victory. However, Mujin entered and informed Jin Mori that they had decided on his punishment. He told Jin Mori that he could rejoin the tournament if he could defeat the man with green hair and glasses. But Jin Mori insisted on fighting the blonde man instead, recalling a humiliating incident from school. He threw a tantrum on the floor, expressing his strong desire to fight the blonde man. The man with glasses claimed that he was stronger than the blonde man and had been chosen for that reason. To prove his strength, he punched Jin Mori in the face. Jin Mori excitedly got up, realizing that the man was stronger than he had thought. The man with the scar then announced that the fight would take place the next day. Yu walked alongside Han, still upset with Jin Mori for intervening in the fight. She was concerned that this might lead to Jin Mori's disqualification from the tournament. However, Han described the incident as incredible and believed that Jin Mori's strength was extraordinary. Suddenly, Jin appeared and informed them about his upcoming fight against the man with green hair and glasses. He also offered them some fruits given to him by the scarred man earlier, mentioning that they would restore their energy. Yu was angry at him for being so reckless, but Jin told them about their families saying that encouraged them to do what they wanted. It was becoming evident that the scarred man and the woman with blue hair were plotting something. 
Afterward, Jin Mori was at home, eating a peach and preparing his bed to sleep. Suddenly, he experienced chest pain and collapsed, coughing up blood. In another location, the man with the scar explained that he had done this to test if Jin Mori was a true fighter, and to see if he was as strong as his grandfather. Next, we find Han visiting a friend in the hospital who is suffering from a severe illness. It's revealed that Han is participating in the tournament to earn money to help his friend. His friend mentions that the doctors will try a new and expensive medicine, and his sister has taken on extra work to cover the treatment costs. She has become so busy that she hardly has time to sleep, and he feels guilty for being a burden to both his friend and his sister. Han reassures him not to worry and to focus on getting better. He tells his friend about a boy he met who reminds him of him, and they start joking and having a good time together. Later, we see Han working as a trash collector, where he encounters some bullies who taunt him, having heard about his friend's dire condition. One of them hits him with a can, dirtying his shirt, but Han picks it up, and the bullies continue to mock him. Back at the arena, Han was preparing to fight in the tournament against a boy who was always seen with a book. The boy claimed to have learned everything from books, including how to win in battle. As the fight began, the boy could predict Han's movements because he had studied all the patterns of karate. He mentioned that if he practiced and learned all the movements, it would be impossible for him to lose. That's why he participated in the tournament, to prove his theory correct. The boy attacked Han with a metal bat, but Han managed to dodge the blows. The boy tried to attack again but slipped and fell. Surprisingly, Han didn't take advantage of the situation. Instead, he offered the boy a hand to help him up. The boy was surprised that Han didn't exploit the moment and asked why. Han explained that it would be cowardly to attack a downed opponent. The boy got up and used a power called 12 Spears, which involved delivering 12 simultaneous strikes, severely injuring Han. The boy told him that these blows had pierced his bones and reached his organs, making it pointless for Han to get up and continue fighting. However, Han recalled his friend's struggle in the hospital who had expressed a strong desire to survive his illness. We returned to the present, and because of this, Han knew he couldn't afford to lose. So, despite his injuries, he got up and continued to fight. The boy launched an attack with 72 spears, but Han countered the boy's onslaught with a move called Black Tortoise. He followed it up with an attack called Vermilion Bird, creating a whirlwind that blinded the boy. Finally, he unleashed White Tiger, the third attack, landing multiple blows on the boy who was left helpless. The boy couldn't believe that his theory had been completely dismantled. Unable to continue with his fourth stance, the boy collapsed and was eliminated from the tournament. Next, they announced the fight between the commissioner with green hair and Mori. However, Jin Mori was unconscious in his house. Suddenly, something inside his body awakened him. Later, as they waited for him to arrive at the fight, everyone thought he wouldn't show up. But then he arrived running and jumped into the ring. Although he seemed a bit tired and didn't know why his body was burning so intensely. Upon seeing him, the green-haired commissioner taunted him, suggesting that he might have been scared to face him. The announcer explained the rules, stating that since it was an uneven match, if Jin Mori knocked his opponent down once, he would win. The fight began, and in the blink of an eye, Jin Mori swiftly took the commissioner's glasses off and knocked him down with minimal effort before the guy could react. The announcer was surprised and shouted that the match was over, leaving the audience upset because it had ended so quickly. Suddenly, the guy became enraged and rushed to attack Jin Mori. But Jin Mori evaded the attack and delivered a kick that sent him flying. The audience fell silent because it was clear that Jin Mori possessed incredible strength. Afterwards, a giant monster or god emerged from the guy's body and began to attack Jin Mori who had to run around the ring to avoid the monstrous attacks. The power of this monster was far beyond anything anyone had seen before. The monster tried to impale Jin Mori with a sword, but something stopped it, and then the monster disappeared. The other commissioners arrived to restrain the green-haired guy, who was furious about the humiliation he had suffered at the hands of Jin Mori. When Mujin arrived, he punished the green-haired man by reducing his salary for three months due to his behavior. Then, he approached Jin Mori, who was resting, and congratulated him on his victory. Jin Mori replied that he was very hungry and wanted to eat a banana. At that moment, there was no doubt in the man's mind that Jin Mori was indeed Jin Tijin's grandson, the so-called Tiger Cub. Next, a television program discussed the God of High School tournament, with the presenters announcing that only four fighters remained from the preliminary round. These fighters were Mori, a practitioner of Renewal Taekwondo, Yu, the successor to the Moonlight Sword style, Han, a top full-contact karate practitioner, and another fighter named Byon Yi, specialized in a Brazilian fighting style. The next match was set to be between Yu and Han, 
After this, our group of friends strolled down the street, discussing who they thought would make it to the final round. Suddenly, a car pulled up in front of them, and a young man got out. He walked toward them, knelt down, and confessed his love for you, asking her if she wanted to marry him. Upon hearing this, the three friends were surprised and embarrassed. In the next scene, Yu is seen with her younger cousin, and they are deciding on the dress she will wear for the wedding. The little girl expresses disbelief that Seongjin has decided to marry Yu, revealing that this young man is a famous fighter who works in television. Seongjin expressed his desire to let Mira and her sword shine. Later, we are shown a flashback to Yu's childhood when her father had died, and she was approached by her uncle. Her uncle told her that she would now live with him and take care of her father's sword. He also attempted to teach martial arts but was too weak, and his students left the academy. Yu declared that she was the rightful owner of the sword and must secure a bright future for it. Later, at the dojo, the uncle asked Seongjin why he wanted to marry Yu. He replied that he had many plans involving her and the sword. He expressed his determination to fulfill a dream that neither he nor his brother could achieve. Later, Mori was trying to decide which burger to order when he overheard a conversation in line about his friend's upcoming marriage. He decided to go to her house to ask her why she was marrying Seongjin. When she asked how he found her house, he revealed that he had asked the people who organized the tournament. Yu tried to close the door, but he held it open and questioned why she was getting married if she wasn't in love, especially at the time of the semifinals. She explained that she had to do it for the sake of the sword and the moonlight style. Afterward, she closed the door and Mori ended up falling down the stairs. However, she appeared to be sad, as she did not want to get married. Next, Mori called Han, who was working as a food delivery driver, and informed him about Yu's marriage to a television personality whom he didn't trust. Han advised him to stop interfering in matters that didn't concern him, but Mori insisted that something didn't seem right because Mira didn't appear happy. In a scene change, Yu was dressed as a bride, and her uncle had memories of her not liking the same things as other girls. She preferred staying at home and cleaning, or when they walked on the street, she would gaze at other girls' clothes. He would ask if she wanted him to buy her some, but she always said she didn't need them. Now, it was strange that she was getting married, and even stranger that she was doing it with someone she didn't love. He went to where Seongjin was and asked him to cancel his niece's wedding, stating that Yu didn't want to get married and that she was still a child. However, as he said this, Yu entered and claimed she was happy and wanted to fulfill her dream of getting married. It was clear that she had something else in mind. She mentioned that Seongjin's power would change the fate of the Moonlight Sword style. Her cousin became sad because Yu didn't usually speak in that manner. Later, we saw the cousin telling Jin Mori about her father and the sword. He wanted to talk to Yu and make her see the reason, but security guards appeared and prevented him from reaching her because he didn't have an invitation. He tried to go over them but was thrown to the ground. In a flashback, we saw Seongjin's true intentions, and we discovered that he belonged to a religious cult where everyone wore robes. In this cult, the leader instructed the young man to obtain the sword along with the hand that wields it, referring to Yu as she was the only one who could control it. The leader mentioned that whoever possessed this sword would be able to rule as a god. Mori was fighting with the security guards, but he couldn't use his taekwondo techniques against them because they were too weak. Suddenly, Han appeared and knocked the security guards aside with his shoulder, defeating them all. He told Jin Mori that he wasn't hitting them but merely pushing them aside. Seongjin looked at his guards and was disappointed in them. Mori interrupted the wedding, but Seongjin attacked him with a sword brought by a servant. However, Han intercepted the sword with his hand, giving Mori an opportunity to speak with Yu. He told her not to marry Seongjin, but she insisted on fulfilling her father's wish, which was for Yu to find someone very strong to inherit the sword. She had rejected all the boys who wanted to date her because they were too weak. While she was explaining this, she threw punches at Mori, who was defending himself. At this point, her uncle intervened, and she accidentally hit him in the face. After this, we saw that both her uncle and her cousin did not want her to get married. Mori told her that she should do what she truly desired, and upon hearing this, she had a childhood memory of her father saying the same words. It became clear that she had misunderstood her father's words, as he was telling her to use whatever technique she wanted to control the sword. Remembering this, she decided and told Seongjin that she didn't want to marry him. She also mentioned that she would protect the Moonlight Sword style herself. However, Seongjin refused and said he would obtain the sword and the girl by any means necessary. He then summoned a deity similar to the one we saw emerge from the green-haired guy during the fight against Mori. 
As a result, the place began to collapse, and Han shouted at people to flee. Xiangjin then attacked Han with his sword and wounded Yu in the stomach, due to her getting in between them. But she quickly struck him with a moonlight move, and he fell unconscious. Both Jin and Han were happy to see her back. Afterwards, they were outside, watching the fire, and Yu felt guilty for everything that happened. Xiangjin escaped in a car with his father's sword, and she said she didn't care if he took it because her father's spirit was not in the sword but inside her. Afterward, she walked away laughing with her friends, and both her uncle and the little girl were happy for her. Later, Han was in the hospital while doctors tried to revive his friend, but they couldn't do anything because he had no pulse. After that, Han was at work, and the usual guys came to taunt him. This time, he didn't allow them to make fun of his friend and beat all three of them. Then, we saw the semifinal of the tournament between Han and Yu. At this moment, Han was filled with rage over his friend's death, and the audience was shocked to see him brutally beating Yu. He wanted to continue hitting her despite her being severely injured and unconscious, so the presenter had to step in to stop him from killing her. After the fight ended, he passed by Mori and told him that they would meet in the final. Mori thought that Han seemed like a different person and not his friend. Two years ago, Han had a memory from before his friend became ill, showing that they used to enjoy fighting every day after school. Then, we returned to the present, and he was in the bathroom, vomiting while thinking about his friend and the injuries he inflicted on Yu. Following this, the other semifinal fight began between Mori and Byon, who used his Brazilian fighting style. However, the fight ended quickly as Mori defeated him with a single attack that knocked him out. Jin displayed immense strength. The presenter then announced that the final would be between Mori and Han, and the winner would participate in the national tournament. Later, Mori visited Yu in the hospital where she was being treated with nanomachine technology. She noticed that he was distracted and told him that he wouldn't be able to win the final against Han that way. She mentioned that she lost because she was weak, but Mori said it was because she was injured from the fight. However, she expressed her concern about why Han had acted the way he did. Later, Han visited his friend in the hospital, who was still alive but in a coma. The next day, the final day of the preliminaries arrived. The fighters were called to the ring, and the match began. Mujin wondered if the tiger cub would awaken, referring to Jin. The fight was evenly matched as both exchanged blows, and neither had the upper hand at this point. Han landed a blow to Mori's mouth, causing him to spit out a lot of blood, just like you had been hit. Mori got up in anger and told Han that he wouldn't forgive him for hurting their friend. He launched several kicks from his renewal taekwondo, and Han fell into the corner. However, Mori approached and extended his hand to help him up. Han took his hand but told him that neither he nor you were his friends. He then began using various techniques to attack Mori. We then saw Yu leaving the hospital with her uncle and cousin. She walked past Han's friend's room and realized that he was being treated with nanotechnology. Several people were gathered there, including the tournament organizers and a girl who was mourning her brother's death. The sister screamed at the deceased guy, urging him to get up and fight his friend Han again, which was what he enjoyed the most. Later, a memory showed the scarred man telling Han that he knew he wanted to win the tournament to help his friend. He offered a deal, if Han won the semifinal and final in a very superior manner, he would cure his friend's illness using nanomachines. This was the reason why Han fought with all his strength against Yu and was doing the same against Mori now. Returning to the present, Han was beating Mori mercilessly with his god stance, and he fell to the ground. The presenter started counting to ten to see if Mori could get up, but before the count reached zero, the scarred man appeared and told Han that his friend had already died. At that moment, Mori got up before the count reached zero. Later, we delve into Han's school days, where he had gained a reputation for winning all his fights, even against older students. In one instance, he found himself outnumbered by students armed with sticks, but an unexpected ally, the friend who would later mean so much to him, appeared to aid him in the battle. After their victory, both exhausted and lying on the ground, the friend questioned Han about why his supposed friends hadn't come to his aid. Han responded with a bitter truth, those he associated with weren't truly his friends. The friend offered a valuable piece of advice, urging Han to place more trust in people. Returning to the present, Han awoke from his unconscious state, grappling with the devastating news of his friend's passing. Mori initiated a brutal attack, but Han defended himself ruthlessly. At this juncture, we learn about the scarred man's previous conversation with Han. He revealed that the nanomachine treatment had been initiated. But regrettably, it was too late. Consequently, their contract had come to an end, leaving Han free to fight as he saw fit. In the heat of the battle, Han reflected on the folly of proclaiming that Mori and the others weren't his friends. He also recalled the words of his departed friend, the advice to trust people more echoing in his mind. 
Despite Mori's relentless assault, Han chose not to resist. In the midst of the intense battle, Yu implored Han to fight as he had when he faced her and handed him a letter left behind by his late friend. Yu cautioned Han not to reveal its contents to Mori, fearing that it might affect their fight. Upon receiving the letter, Han recollected his friend writing it before his untimely demise. The letter conveyed his happiness and encouraged Han to fight for himself. Filled with newfound determination, they engaged in a fierce battle, both content as they gave their all. Mori unleashed a powerful blue dragon kick, causing Han to tumble to the ground. The announcer declared Jin Mori the tournament's winner. Han had another memory, this time of a fight he had won against his friend, who was overjoyed and suggested they share a smile. Han, however, asserted that smiling wouldn't bring them any victories, to which his friend insisted that they would become best friends. Back in the present, as Mori extended his hand, Han realized that Mori's smile mirrored that of his departed friend. They shook hands, and Mori declared them friends. Yu assisted Han to his feet, declaring her intent to defeat him in their next match. Together, they walked away, and the audience erupted in applause, celebrating their newfound friendship. Jin Mori's grandfather, named Jin Tijin, finds himself deep in the forest when a group of men dressed in robes from the religious cult suddenly appears. One of them approaches the elderly man, suggesting that strong individuals should unite and join their cause, claiming that they've been bestowed with power from heaven. However, the old man vehemently refuses, asserting his right to live life on his own terms, a sentiment he often shares with his grandson. In response to this refusal, the man's expression changes, hinting that he might have used some form of power or manipulation on the elderly man. Mori lies on his bed, pondering the whereabouts of his long-lost grandfather, whom he hasn't seen since his childhood. Meanwhile, on television, the presenters make an announcement about the upcoming national tournament, which will be held in teams starting in two weeks. To participate in this tournament, the top three fighters from each regional preliminary must form teams. In order to determine the third and fourth place fighters, Yu competes against the fighter skilled in Brazilian style and easily secures the third place position. Mori enthusiastically cheers for her from the audience, but both Yu and Han feel somewhat embarrassed. The tournament administrators review detailed analyzes of the teams, and a sudden rule change is enacted. This change is motivated by the realization that anyone on the teams could be the key, as they all possess key-like qualities. They understand that the key is awakened when the individual's strongest emotion triggers their latent power. Additionally, the administration expresses concern about the cult's increasing audacity after the preliminaries, as they are pursuing the same objectives. Mori expresses his happiness that Yu has won, ensuring that all three of them can participate in the upcoming big tournament as a team. They walk down the street together, and Mori is excited about the prospect of going to the tournament with his friends. However, a sudden realization strikes him, in a team competition, he won't be able to fight against his friends. Yu questions why he would want to fight against them, and Mori responds that being the strongest is incredibly cool. During this conversation, Mori senses someone passing by, but the person disappears quickly, leaving him intrigued. Later, we see an elderly man who has been sent by the scarred man to spy on Mori. It becomes clear that this elderly man is a master, and they summon these masters using cards. There are six of them in total. The elderly man used to be Mujin's teacher, and he believes that Jin Mori must be strong because he survived after consuming the sage fruit. Thus, the elderly man intends to mentor him. Continuing the storyline, we are shown what transpired with Mori's grandfather. The men in robes summon a god from the sky, creating a portal through which a giant sword descends pointing towards the elderly man and causing massive destruction in its wake. This catastrophic event makes them believe that the end of the world is imminent. Yu is deeply contemplating her role in the team, feeling like she's merely an extra. Later, she encounters the fight presenter while he is with his family at a store. She notices that he is blind and congratulates her on her victory in the fight. He then tells her that the real tournament is about to begin and that she needs to tap into the full power of the Moonlight Sword style. He emphasizes that she must invest her emotions into the sword, otherwise, her strength will be in vain. Surprisingly, he reveals that he lost his sight due to the Moonlight Sword. As the presenter heads back to his car, he detects a foul odor, which turns out to be emanating from a member of Nox. Afterward, Han has a conversation with Mujin, who questions whether Han still wishes to participate in the tournament after his friend's death, implying that he doesn't have to continue fighting. Han responds by stating his commitment to repaying a significant debt and his determination to win the tournament, as it's what his late friend would have wanted. He also expresses his curiosity about the hidden power behind the tournament, alluding to the god that emerged from the green-haired man during Mori's fight. 
This revelation captures the scarred man's attention as he gazes at images of gods on the wall. Mori is dedicated to his training in an effort to gain more muscle and surprise you and Han. However, his training regimen includes activities that are not very effective, such as chasing after a cat. In another instance, he assists some children in retrieving a balloon stuck in a tree. Unfortunately, the branch breaks, causing him to fall and twist his ankle. Unbeknownst to Mori, the elderly man seen earlier appears behind him and inserts a needle into his ankle, miraculously relieving his pain. Following this, the scarred man explains the concept of gods and how individuals can extract power from them, effectively using it in combat as if they were gods themselves. This transcends human understanding, and those who harness this power are known as Charyok. Later, Yu and Han pay a visit to Mori's house. When Mori questions how they found his home, Yu playfully responds with the same answer he provided when he visited her house. Upon entering Mori's residence, they are met with a disheveled and untidy environment. Mori explains that he used to live with his grandfather in the mountains but relocated to the current place to attend school. The three friends exchange the knowledge they have acquired over time discussing topics like Charyok and Mori's healing abilities, as he successfully relieves Yu's sore shoulder. They recognize the need to stay vigilant, as many of the fighters in the tournament are now wielding the power of gods. The highly anticipated national tournament, featuring the country's best teams, is on the verge of commencing. In total, there are three fighters representing each of the nine regions, making for a total of 27 competitors. The stakes are high, as the tournament promises the winners the incredible power of a god, which has the potential to grant any wish. Yu keenly observes that the presenter for the tournament is different from the one they encountered previously. However, a disturbing revelation soon unfolds as it's broadcasted on television that the previous presenter was brutally murdered in a park. The shocking news sends shockwaves through the audience and participants alike. We then catch a glimpse of the individual responsible for this heinous crime, who appears to revel in the chaos and violence he has caused. He expresses sinister satisfaction at having also eliminated the green-haired commissioner with glasses, one of the tournament's strongest contenders. The presenter explains that there will be three fights, and the team that wins two of them will move on to the next round. Mori steps up to fight first, and Yu cautions him to be careful because the opposing team is formidable. However, he isn't fearful and shares that he has acquired a new skill. During the battle, he touches different points on his body, explaining that it will unleash his hidden power. In the audience, the elderly man takes pride in teaching him this new ability, which is part of Tijin's Taekwondo. Unfortunately, Mori couldn't move because he touched the wrong spots on his body, allowing his opponent to capitalize on the situation, delivering powerful kicks and securing victory in the first match. In the second match, Han faces the largest member of the opposing team, the presenter points out that this fighter is the oldest in the tournament, at 38 years old, surprising the audience as he doesn't resemble a high school student. In another scene, the person responsible for killing the presenter and the green-haired commissioner gloats about how easy it was to take their lives. However, it's revealed that the green-haired man, named Q, miraculously survived despite having a sword through his lung. He summons a god, which swiftly severs the assassin's arm. Back at the tournament, Han is locked in a fierce battle against his older opponent. Han manages to land multiple powerful punches on Pum, causing worry for Pum's brother. However, Jang, Pum's brother, reassures him not to fret, as Pum never gives up. This triggers a flashback to Pum Kwang's time working in construction, where fellow workers ridiculed him for his repeated failures to pass the high school entrance exam. His brother delivers a bag of books for him to study with, and they discuss Pum's determination. Meanwhile, Jang watches from a distance and declares her determination not to become a loser like them. After losing a fencing competition, she vents her frustration by throwing her fencing sword against a wall. Pum Kwang approaches her in inquiries about her well-being. She already knows his name, as people often gossip and speak ill of him. Curious, she questions why he keeps trying when everyone mocks him for being a poor student and older. Pum Kwang reveals that he refuses to give up, sharing that he attempted various endeavors after leaving school, but ultimately gave up on all of them. He advises Jang not to give up if she truly wants to achieve something. Then, he leaves, running to work in the rain. The scene shifts back to the present, where Han is in the ring, but his opponent delivers a powerful blow that sends him to a corner. Pum Kwang expresses his strong desire to win the tournament because his dream is to help people who aspire to study but are struggling. He summons the Thor's hammer with Charyok and attacks Han, 
who manages to stop the attack and destroy the hammer using the power of the blue dragon. Pum Quang falls to the ground, and Han is declared the winner. In another scene, the battle between Q and the assassin who attempted to kill him intensifies. Q swiftly severs the assassin's other arm, but the killer boasts that he can regenerate indefinitely. Unfazed, Q launches several cards that pierce the assassin's body, immobilizing him. As Q prepares to deliver a fatal blow, a boy and a girl arrive on the scene, both of whom are priests from the cult. The boy introduces himself as Ixlai, and the girl is Saturn. They wield strange powers and attack Q. However, the white-haired organizer, aware that Q had removed his limiter, arrives to assist him. She had sensed something amiss and came to investigate. Back at the tournament, the final match between Yu and Jang is about to commence, and the victor will determine which team advances to the next round. Initially, both girls wield sticks in their fight, but Jang quickly realizes that Yu holds the advantage. Pum Kwang fervently cheers for Jang, urging her to fight with unwavering determination and not give up. Jang conjures a power resembling a yellow light sword and attempts to strike Yu, but Yu skillfully evades the attack. Recalling the presenter's words in the park, Yu unleashes the full power of the Moonlight Sword style, delivering a powerful kick that shatters Jang's sword and secures her victory. Returning to the confrontation between Q and the white-haired girl, they emerge victorious against the cult priests. However, before they can execute the priests, Xli grabs Saturn, and the two of them manage to escape. Meanwhile, the other assassin's head begins to swell uncontrollably, eventually causing an explosion that engulfs the entire apartment and cuts off power throughout the building. Miraculously, they survive the explosion. Later, Mori and Yu celebrate their victory, while Han reflects on the moment when he struck Yu so forcefully during their fight, vowing never to repeat such an action. Jang regains consciousness, and Pum Kwang expresses his concern for her. He reassures her that it's not the end, and they will have another opportunity to compete next year. The next match begins with a green-haired boy named Jian Jugok, who creates a power using musical notes and fire. However, his opponent, Jegel Teak, summons a colossal shark that mercilessly attacks Jugok, causing him to lose a significant amount of blood. In response, a girl from Jugok's team attempts to intervene and help him, but Jegel Teak repeatedly kicks her while she's defenseless on the ground, shocking both the audience and the participants. Yu wants to prevent Mori from intervening, fearing disqualification. But this time, Han steps in to confront Jegel Teak. The announcer positions himself between them, and the injured boy, determined to win for the sake of his family's corporation, rises to his feet. He conjures and fires lightning, but Jegel Teak effortlessly counters it and summons the shark once more, which devours the boy. In the emergency room, doctors are attending to the injured boy while Park, the scarred man, contemplates the situation. An elderly man suggests that Jegel should be disqualified because it's evident that he intended to cause chaos in the tournament. However, Park responds by hinting that Jegel might be the key they've been searching for. Meanwhile, Jin Mori, Yu, and Han are in the audience, watching the ongoing fights. Han and Yu discuss the upcoming opponents, and Han remembers that he has been suspended from participating due to his previous intervention. Jin Mori, on the other hand, is impressed by a fighter named Park Ilpio who effortlessly wins his match with a powerful kick. Park Ilpio's hoodie, adorned with a tiger emblem, reminds Mori of his grandfather's military uniform. As they stroll down the street, Han mentions the importance of getting stronger and mastering Charyok, the ability to summon the power of a god. In a flashback, Park Mugen explains that some fighters spend years honing their skills to obtain Charyok, but success is far from guaranteed. Others are inspired and acquire this power more easily. However, Jin Mori expresses his desire to win based on his own strength, and refuses to rely on the power of gods. This decision leaves you concerned because Mori seems different, appearing sad and quieter than usual. Jin Mori's memory takes him back to a conversation with Park and the girl with blue hair, where they informed him that his grandfather had recently suffered an attack in the mountains, and they discovered a significant amount of his blood at the scene. While Park Mugen was concerned about the slim chances of survival, Jin remained confident in his grandfather's abilities. Back in the present, Jin Mori is lost in thought and expresses his disbelief that his grandfather was killed. At that moment, Park Ilpio approaches him with excitement, eager to meet him. They exchange friendly punches, both ending up in a deadlock, and neither of them takes it further. Ilpio apologizes for his enthusiasm and offers a hand to help Jin up. During their conversation, Park Ilpio reveals that he has been following Jin Mori's progress since the preliminary rounds. Jin Mori, curious about the tiger symbol on Ilpio's hoodie, inquiries about it, and Park explains that he wears it as a sign of respect for Jin Tijin, 
Mori's grandfather. Park Ilpio shares his childhood story with Jin Mori, revealing that his mother abandoned him after his father's funeral. He was then placed in a martial arts academy, where he felt lonely and isolated. One day, Jin Tijin appeared with a young Jin Mori sleeping on his chest. Jin Tijin approached Park Ilpio, explaining that he had fought alongside Ilpio's grandfather in a war. He gave Ilpio a book of martial arts techniques called Tikayon, which his grandfather had studied throughout his life. Jin Tijin encouraged Ilpio to grow up quickly and become a great fighter. As he left, Ilpio noticed the tiger symbol on Jin Tijin's uniform which left a lasting impression on him. During their conversation, Ilpio intercepts an attack that was aimed at Jin Mori, using his skills to stop the shark's teeth launched by Jekyll. Ilpio then confronts Jekyll, warning him not to harm innocent people. A flashback reveals Ilpio delivering a powerful blow to Jekyll, leaving a strong impression on him. Afterward, Jekyll departs, and Ilpio cautions Jin Mori about the danger that Jekyll poses. Jin Mori is surprised and grateful for Ilpio's assistance, realizing that he wouldn't have been able to stop the attack without him. The scene shifts to Jin Mori training as he strives to become even stronger. Hugh barges into Park's office with anger, questioning why Park allowed the family of the deceased presenter to be murdered. In response, Park strikes Q and reminds him that he needs to compensate for the apartment damage caused during their fight. He also informs Q that nine months of his salary will be deducted as a consequence of his actions. Later, on a rooftop, the blue-haired girl explains to Q that she created a fake body to deceive their enemies while the real wife and daughter were moved to a safe location. Meanwhile, Q retrieves a coin from beneath a soda machine, and Han, who works at the same location, observes him. Han approaches Q and makes an offer. He wants Q to teach him how to use Charyuk, and in return, Han promises to prepare lunch for him every day, allowing Q to save the money he would otherwise spend on food. Han's motivation is to become stronger than Jin Mori and ultimately defeat him. He senses that Jin Mori is troubled, and Han wants to be a reliable ally. Park meets with the tournament organizers and reveals that a dangerous religious cult called Nox is targeting them. He urges them to eliminate any member of this organization if they encounter them. Meanwhile, the members of the Nox cult gather for a meeting, and their leader declares war on the organizers of the God of High School tournament. In another scene, Jin Mori reflects on his 17th birthday and his long separation from his grandfather, Jin Tijin. He recalls that his grandfather left him to confront dangerous adversaries when he was just a child. Yu and Han surprise him with birthday wishes, bringing food and spending the evening playing and having fun together. They make a pact to win the tournament, even though Han can't participate due to his suspension. The following day, Jin Mori receives a letter containing a map and a photo of his grandfather, who is shown bound by chains, raising concerns about his safety. Jin Mori rushes on his bicycle, determined to save his grandfather. He mentally apologizes to Yu and Han, promising to return in time for the tournament. Meanwhile, the quarterfinals have begun, featuring a match between Seoul and Jeju, two teams that were seeded into the tournament at the last minute. Yu and Han search for Jin Mori but can't find him anywhere. The blue-haired woman suddenly appears and informs them that the fight is about to start, urging them to return to the stadium. She warns that if Jin Mori doesn't arrive before his turn, he will be disqualified, and their team will be eliminated from the tournament. Later, Yu stands alone in the ring as Han was disqualified earlier. She resolves to buy time for Jin Mori to return. Just as she prepares to face the opposing team, they arrive wearing black robes, raising suspicions that they might be associated with the Nox organization. The fighter set to battle Yu removes his robe, revealing his muscular body and a wooden sword that belonged to Yu's father, adding tension to the upcoming fight. In the midst of her fight, Yu's wooden sword shatters, and her formidable opponent reveals a national treasure known as Fengxian, harnessing its immense power. This revelation shocks Yu, as she was unaware of the sword hidden within her weapon. Her muscular adversary taunts her, highlighting that despite years of training, she never realized the true nature of her sword. As the intense battle continues, Yu manages to disarm her opponent momentarily. However, when she attempts to wield the sword, she recognizes it as her own but it promptly vanishes from her grip and reappears in her adversary's hand. He explains that the sword recognizes its true owner, and it now acknowledges him as such. Meanwhile, Jin Mori arrives at an abandoned location in pursuit of his grandfather, only to discover a disturbing scene. 
he finds a person impersonating his grandfather, and when this imposter's head grotesquely turns backward and then inflates, it results in a catastrophic explosion, obliterating the surroundings. A mysterious man appears and informs Jin Mori that his intention is to eliminate the strongest competitors in the tournament in his quest to reach the key. Jin Mori, undaunted, prepares for a fierce battle as the man multiplies into numerous identical clones. Simultaneously, Yu continues to endure a brutal beating from her powerful opponent, who mocks her for her perceived lack of strength. Pan's search for Jin Mori leads him to a room where he discovers Pum lying on the ground. As he enters the room, a woman appears, prompting Han to engage in combat briefly. However, he decides that he doesn't have the time to waste on this confrontation. In the midst of this encounter, Jekyll enters the room and is seen admonishing the woman for her actions. Then, we return to Jin Mori's fight, and he struggles to defeat the clones because of their overwhelming numbers. They all launch themselves at him, breaking through the floor. As they fall, Jin Mori realizes that the lifeless bodies of the Jeju team members that Yu is fighting are present. The man explains that they killed the Jeju team members and assumed their identities to secure victory against Jin Mori's team. Jin Mori presses certain points on his body, numbing himself for the next hour. Meanwhile, the muscular opponent continues to overpower Yu, and she lacks the strength to defend herself. He taunts her, suggesting that Jin Mori won't return. Yu begins to strike back upon learning that her friend has been harmed. However, her attacks lack the power to inflict any damage. The muscular opponent delivers a powerful blow, causing Yu to fall unconscious. Yet, at that moment, she finds herself suspended in the air, and begins to sink into her subconscious. She hears the voice of a god of war and recalls the fond memories she shared with her friends. The god of war decides to grant her its powers. Yu rises, and we witness her ability to summon the god named Lu Bu. As a result, her sword returns to her hand. The muscular man also harnesses his chariok, Kraken, but Yu easily defeats him. The announcer declares Yu the winner, but she feels extremely tired and collapses to the ground. Just before hitting the ground, Jin Mori arrives and supports her. Yu is relieved to see him. The presenter then announces the start of the second match. While they are tending to Yu's injuries, Han expresses his happiness that she managed to acquire chariok. However, they can't help but notice that Jin Mori is unusually angry, unlike anything they've seen from him before. The fight commences, and Jin Mori's opponent inquiries about how he managed to escape from the clones. Jin Mori remains silent and launches a powerful attack using blue dragons. This power isn't derived from a god but was created by Jin Mori himself. As we witness Jin Mori striking his opponent, it simultaneously reveals how he defeated the clone man earlier. In a later scene, we delve into Ilpio's memories, where Jekyll inflicts a severe injury on his best friend, Soon Jin, by breaking his leg. At the hospital, they inform Ilpio that while Soon Jin will eventually be able to walk again, she will never be able to practice martial arts. Ilpio seeks out Jekyll and subjects him to a thorough beating on the ground, demanding that he apologize to his injured friend. However, the police arrive and apprehend Ilpio. Following this incident, as he exits the police station, a man outside hands him a letter. It's revealed that this letter is an invitation to participate in the God of High School tournament. After considering the offer, he and the other girl decide to join the tournament with the hope that the prize money can help their friend. Park explains to Jin Mori, Han, and Yu what transpired with the imposter Jeju team. He reveals that these individuals posed as others in an attempt to eliminate them from the tournament, but their efforts failed. The group will still compete in the semifinals. Han inquires about the motive behind the attack and who might be behind it. The scarred man discloses that it was orchestrated by the Knox organization. Meanwhile, we revisit the man with the clones who had been defeated by Jin Mori and is now severely injured. Jekyll arrives and asserts that he isn't a member of the organization but cooperates with them to gather information. As he departs, he summons the giant shark, killing the injured man and declares his intention to claim the key. The tournament presses on, and Jin Mori's team squares off against Ilpio's team. Yu and Han continue to observe Jin Mori's unusual behavior, noting that he is quieter than usual. Subsequently, the fight between Han and the girl named Sunga commences. Sunga launches a fierce assault on Han, but he recalls the information Park shared with them earlier. Park had explained that Nox's objective is to prevent others from harnessing Charyok's power and those who master it must join their organization. This is why they abducted Jin Mori's grandfather, who possesses immense power. The group expresses their determination to confront Nox, but Park reminds them that they are still too weak. However, he promises to provide them with information about Nox if they emerge victorious in the tournament. 
In the midst of the fight, Han lands a powerful strike on the girl, sending her tumbling to a corner of the ring. Ilpio advises her not to continue as the odds are stacked against her. However, she resolutely refuses to yield, emphasizing that she refuses to fear the same fate that befell Seungjun. She's determined to honor her friend's memory by fighting until her last breath. With this determination, she launches another attack at Han, but his strength proves insurmountable, and he emerges victorious. Han approaches Jin Mori, who has been exhibiting a different demeanor, and reassures him that they, as a team, will win the tournament together. Following this, Yu embraces them, stressing the importance of their unity and support for one another. Jin Mori, moved by his friend's words, realizes he had been acting wrongly and reverts to his playful and jovial self. Meanwhile, Ilpio watches their interaction with a sense of sadness as they tend to his defeated friend. Soon Jin arrives and acknowledges that Sunga had mentioned their participation in the tournament. She expresses gratitude to Ilpio for his concern regarding her leg. However, she encourages him to fight not for her but for his own desires, particularly his wish to confront Jin Mori. Fueled by her words, Ilpio prepares to return to the ring, claiming that he now feels ready to do so. In a different scene, we witness the leader of Nox, Sang, unleashing his deadly powers, disintegrating several individuals. His actions are interrupted by Park, who has seemingly reappeared after a long absence. Sang acknowledges that it has been a while since Park made an appearance and then proceeds to reveal his knowledge about Park's intent to organize the tournament in search of the dormant key. Following this revelation, Sang performs a potent spell that manifests a symbol in the sky emitting a piercing light that shoots into the heavens, creating a portal. Through this portal descends a colossal sword, the very same one that once appeared to Jin Mori's grandfather. Subsequently, we return to the ongoing tournament, where the highly anticipated battle between Jin Mori and Ilpio is set to commence. As the fight begins, Ilpio candidly informs Jin Mori that his current Taekwondo skills won't be sufficient to defeat him. Ilpio proceeds to outline three crucial mistakes he believes Jin Mori is making an inability to handle close combat, announcing his attacks aloud, and techniques that place excessive strain on his own body. Ilpio begins landing blows on Jin Mori, who seems helpless. Ilpio takes the opportunity to taunt Jin Mori, suggesting that his grandfather would be immensely disappointed in his current state of weakness. At this pivotal moment, Jin Mori contemplates how to turn the tide of the battle, and abruptly employs Yu's Moonlight Sword-style technique, surprising both Yu and Ilpio. This technique proves effective as it damages Ilpio. Jin Mori follows up with Han's Black Tortoise technique, demonstrating that he's actively addressing the weaknesses Ilpio had identified earlier. Turning our attention back to the portal, a shadowy figure with godlike characteristics emerges and exerts force upon the giant sword. Sang had hoped for this godlike being to pass judgment upon the tournament's organizers. However, Park intervenes by summoning a cross-shaped shield preventing the sword from wreaking havoc upon the city. Subsequently, a man wearing a hat, accompanied by a group of drummers, conducts a series of invocations, opening yet another portal. From this portal, hands emerge and seize hold of the sword. It becomes evident that their leader has summoned one of the six powerful beings. Meanwhile, on the city streets, the organizers find themselves engaged in combat with Nox followers. Park struggles to maintain the cross-shaped shield, which still forms a protective barrier. At this critical juncture, a creature emerges from the second portal, clamping its jaws onto the sword and causing it to shatter. The organizers erupt in jubilation, celebrating their hard-fought victory. Following these events, we return to the intense battle between Jin Mori and Ilpio, where both fighters are pushing themselves to the limit, unleashing the full extent of their powers. It becomes evident that Ilpio has been providing guidance to Mori throughout the fight, leading to an impressive display of martial prowess. In a moment of reflection, we glimpse a memory from the past when Jin Tijin and Jin Mori visited Ilpio at the Martial Arts Academy. During their visit, the elderly man asked Ilpio if he would be willing to teach his grandson some valuable lessons if they were ever to cross paths. Remarkably, Ilpio fulfills this promise by imparting his knowledge to Jin Mori. As the battle reaches its climax, Ilpio eventually falls to the ground, defeated but content. He takes solace in the fact that he has fulfilled his commitment to Jin Tijin by helping his grandson become incredibly strong. However, as he lies on the ground, he enters a peculiar dreamlike state where he encounters a white-tailed fox. In this moment, Ilpio fervently declares that he cannot afford to lose. To the astonishment of all witnesses, he rises to his feet, undergoing a dramatic transformation. His hair turns white, his eyes glow yellow, and he manifests nine fiery tails. This astonishing transformation leaves everyone 
including Park and Sang. In all, as the power emanating from Ilpio surpasses anything they have ever witnessed. Upon witnessing this extraordinary development, Sang smiles and proclaims that the key has finally revealed itself. Of course, I can assist with that. Please go ahead and share the chapter you'd like me to edit for clarity and readability, and I'll make the necessary adjustments in past tense and at a 7th grade reading level. Back in the midst of the fight, everyone, including Jin Mori, is astounded by Ilpio's transformation. Jegel's Charyok resonance led him to believe that Ilpio might be the key. Ilpio confidently announces that the real battle is about to commence. Jin Mori attempts to strike Ilpio, but his blows prove ineffective due to an invisible barrier that shields Ilpio. In response, Ilpio launches a series of devastating counterattacks, causing Jin Mori to be thrown to the ground. Uncertain of how to overcome this formidable opponent, Yu and Han watch in amazement, impressed by Jin Mori's unwavering determination. Ilpio motions towards his head, and Jin Mori notices his evident distress. In a series of defensive maneuvers, Jin Mori realizes that Charyok involves not only harnessing power, but also mastering one's own mind and body. In this realization, they find themselves on equal ground. Ilpio releases a fiery fox attack directed at Jin Mori, but as the fiery beasts approach him, they disintegrate into nothingness. The day grows dark, and a brilliant light radiates from Jin Mori, extending towards the heavens. He begins emitting powerful rays of energy from his body, leaving Ilpio astonished by this sudden surge of power. Following his incredible transformation, Ilpio launches a formidable attack known as the Night Parade of 100 Demons. However, Jin Mori responds by creating a powerful whirlwind that propels Ilpio high into the clouds. From above, a colossal hand descends, forcefully returning Ilpio to the ring and ending his transformation. The announcer officially declares Jin Mori as the victor, prompting the audience to erupt in celebration of the epic battle. Yu and Han excitedly jump into the ring to embrace Jin Mori. Han inquires if Jin Mori had utilized his chariot but Jin Mori himself remains uncertain about the extraordinary events that just unfolded. Sang, on the other hand, is taken aback by the outcome and exercises caution before making his departure. Meanwhile, Mujin instructs the team to secure the key while he seeks immediate medical attention for his injuries. After their lighthearted banter, Jin Mori pays a visit to Ilpio in the hospital room. They continue their friendly dispute over who's the stronger fighter. However, once they're left alone, Jin Mori confides in Ilpio, revealing that he's currently unaware of his grandfather's whereabouts. He expresses his determination to win the tournament, as the scarred man has promised to provide information about his grandfather if he emerges victorious. Concerned for Jin Mori's safety, Ilpio offers a word of caution, emphasizing the danger of facing Jegel in the finals. Despite the impending challenge, Ilpio pats Jin Mori's head affectionately, evoking memories of their shared childhood and the bond they've developed. Following his injuries from Jegel's previous attack, Jian Jubak is determined to continue fighting for his family's corporation. As he walks through a hospital corridor, he unexpectedly encounters Jegel. The two engage in a fierce battle, with Jugok undergoing a monstrous transformation that allows him to absorb people. In his rampage, he captures Ilpio's friends, trapping them in his body. Ilpio, despite still recovering from his own injuries, attempts to confront Jugok but is severely weakened. Jegel intervenes by using his shark teeth to pierce Jugok's monstrous form, successfully rescuing the girl who had been absorbed. However, Jugok releases his body tissue, capturing Ilpio's friends in the process. Although the girl trapped inside Jugok tries to reason with him, Jugok's frenzy continues, leading to a gruesome encounter where Jegel summons his shark, resulting in the girl's demise and severe injuries to the boy. Witnessing the suffering of his friends, Ilpio is consumed by anger. He grabs Jegel, and their battle escalates, ultimately leading to both of them falling from the top of a building. In a separate scene, Sang, the leader of Knox, makes a declaration while walking down the street. He announces that he has finally identified the key and releases flying monsters into the area. In response to this escalating threat, Park decides to bring an end to the God of High School tournament. Amidst the escalating chaos, a colossal god-like figure descends through the portal, its shadowy presence casting a sense of awe and dread over Jin Mori, Yu, and Han. Sang, the leader of Knox, seems to revel in these events, declaring it as both the beginning and the end of something significant. Shifting scenes, we witness the grandfather of Jugok, who is determined to avenge his grandson's tragic death, even if it means sacrificing his own life for this cause. The narrative then delves into Jegel's backstory, shedding light on his past. It is revealed that he was forcibly separated from his mother and subjected to intense training with the expectation of becoming a winner. 
and inheriting the family fortune. Despite taking devastating blows from Ilpio during their battle, Jekyll staunchly refuses to embrace the label of loser that his father had associated with his mother. Back in the present, Jekyll and Ilpio are locked in a ferocious battle, where both of them unleash their Charyuk powers to their fullest extent. Ilpio's anger has consumed him, blinding him to reason, while Jekyll recognizes this transformation, likening Ilpio to an untamed animal. Meanwhile, the tournament organizers find themselves engaged in combat against the flying monsters that have emerged from the portal. Hugh is elated, as he stands to earn a substantial sum of money for each monster he eliminates, which he plans to use to pay off his debt. Hark intervenes, creating a protective shield in the sky to prevent the descending god from wreaking havoc on the city. Sang, the leader of Nox, reveals his sinister goal, to obliterate every fragment of the world itself. Ilpio persists in his assault against Jekyll, but Jekyll retaliates by summoning a monstrous entity that bites into Ilpio, causing him to revert to his original state. The key, which had been within Ilpio, hovers in the air, becoming the focal point of a fierce struggle as numerous individuals vie for possession. Ultimately, Sang manages to grab hold of the key, only to have it swiftly kicked away by Jin Mori, who is perplexed as to why everyone is fiercely contending for it. Meanwhile, Park continues to maintain the protective shield, resisting the destructive force of the descending god. In response to the escalating crisis, the United States government launches nuclear missiles and withdraws its alliance with Mugen, asserting that their advanced technology renders the old gods powerless. Given this dire situation, someone alerts Park, who casts a spell to transport the tournament participants to a remote location amid the mountains. However, Ilpio sustains serious injuries in the process. Han employs his Charyok, which possesses healing properties, to tend to Ilpio's injured friends. In that moment, Sunjian provides Jin Mori with an explanation regarding Ilpio's motivation for helping him become stronger. Ilpio foresaw powerful threats looming over the entire city, prompting his efforts to prepare Jin Mori for these challenges. Just then, Ilpio regains consciousness, and Jin Mori reveals the presence of the key to him. Although Ilpio remains unaware of the key's nature or why it resided within him, he earnestly implores Jin Mori to keep it safe and refrain from surrendering it to anyone. Jekyll reappears on the scene and inquiries about the key's whereabouts to you and Han. However, they steadfastly refuse to divulge any information, prompting Jekyll to launch an attack against them. In a subsequent scene, Jin Mori embarks on a search for his friends and discovers them in a severely injured state. Han advises him to flee due to Jekyll's overwhelming strength. Jekyll boldly declares himself the victor and proclaims his intent to claim everything, including the key, as his own. After that, the god continued to break the shield, and at that moment, all the people in the city disappeared. The old man, Jian Yisen, had teleported the people to a location outside the city to protect them from harm. He only sought revenge against those who had killed his grandson. Following this, Jian pierced the nuclear missiles and used his divine power as one of the six to destroy the god's shield. The flying monsters died in the explosion. During the fight between Mori and Jekyll, they both felt a powerful explosion and returned to Seoul. Jian fell to the ground, while Sang remained unharmed. Upon seeing Jin Mori, Sang asked him about the key. However, Jekyll summoned monsters that surrounded Mori's friends, using a tentacle that emerged from his back. Jekyll bound Jin Mori and took the hidden key from him. With the key in his possession, Jekyll stated that he could finally surpass the gods. He devoured the key and transformed into a baby, rapidly growing and sprouting wings like an angel. Afterward, he reached his final form, which looked very different from his previous appearance. Jekyll mentioned that it was his destiny to absorb everything and return to nothing, and he declared his intent to kill all the weaklings. Hark and the other organizers observed that the gods seemed to have been defeated, but Jian died after causing the explosion and they didn't know where Sang was. Meanwhile, Jin Mori, Yu, and Han contemplated leaving the area when suddenly Jekyll appeared in his new form and began to attack them. His strength was vastly superior, and even Jin Mori was injured by his blows. He grew angry with Jekyll for harming his friends and used the acupuncture technique taught by the old man. This technique involved touching various parts of his body to overcome his physical limits. With renewed strength, they started attacking Jekyll together, but he retaliated with lightning. Giant monsters then appeared, attempting to crush them. Jekyll wanted them to suffer before dying and threw a spear-like power at them. However, Han stepped in and got hit in the back. Despite his injuries, Han asked his friends to escape. In that moment, Jin Mori unleashed a new power, and a giant staff fell from the sky. Sang was shocked to witness this and realized that Jin Mori was the guardian of the key, Satan Teze. Mori removed the headband from his forehead, 
which transformed into a crown. His eyes changed color and the staff shrunk to his size. Jin Mori grabbed it and began to beat Jekyll with it. Everyone watching was utterly amazed as Jin Mori unleashed his newfound power. Jekyll summoned giant monsters, but Jin Mori easily pierced through them with the staff. His anger was palpable as he demanded an apology from Jekyll for hurting his friends. Jin Mori began to name each of the people Jekyll had injured, taking revenge for their suffering. He hurled Jekyll toward the ground at tremendous speed. Despite his injuries, Jekyll got up and declared that he would never be a loser. In response, Jin Mori gathered clouds in the sky and repeatedly struck Jekyll with lightning. Park informed the organizers that Mori's power was not borrowed from a god but had become divine at that moment. Jekyll lost his transformation and fell defeated to the ground, while Sang and his followers disappeared. Hugh and Han approached Mori with hugs, relieved to see him back to his usual self, hungry and all. However, Mori struggled to remember what had just transpired, and the crown on his head caused him intense pain. Jekyll managed to rise once more, but his face began to age rapidly. Determined, he transformed into a grotesque, multi-handed monster. Mori attempted to summon his powers again, but they failed him. Just then, Ilpio arrived and reminded him to trust his comrades. The four friends embraced each other, ready to face Jekyll together. They reveled in the joy of fighting alongside each other, and Mori unleashed the power of the blue dragons, ultimately obliterating the monster. In his final moments, Jekyll recalled a memory of his mother bidding him farewell. Despite Ilpio's attempt to reach out to him, Jekyll pulled away, bidding him to live a good life. He was then devoured by one of his own monsters, meeting his end. Ilpio managed to catch some fragments of the key from Jekyll's vanishing body. Then, a woman emerged, declaring herself one of the six and the progenitor of the human race, claiming to be the strongest and most significant figure in the tournament. She informed them that, as the winners, they had the privilege to make any wish they desired. In a rush, Mori approached the woman, expressing his desire for help to save his grandfather. However, in that moment, he recognized the needs of his friends, some of whom were missing body parts due to the battle's toll. Mori realized he couldn't be selfish and decided to put his own wishes aside. Instead, he made a selfless wish for the injured participants to have their bodies restored to their original, uninjured state. The woman used her power, and miraculously, those who had lost limbs or suffered injuries were completely healed, returning to their condition before the battle. She also informed Mori that his grandfather was indeed alive, though his presence felt extremely weak. Mori shouted for joy upon hearing the news, and his crown disappeared, but he fell into a deep slumber due to exhaustion. The scene shifts, and Mori awakens from a three-month slumber. He heads to the kitchen, where he finds Yu and Han busy cooking. In a flashback, the wish-granting woman informs Ilpio that the key fragments have been scattered across the world. She entrusts him, as the guardian of the key, with the task of gathering them, as the key possesses the power to challenge and potentially defeat the gods. Mori learns that to regain his lost memories from the battle, he must visit Satan Teze's homeland. Determined to grow stronger, Mori, Yu, and Han decide to embark on a journey to a distant location. They share a heartfelt moment, hugging each other, and Mori expresses his belief that the three of them will become stronger together. He also vows to find his missing grandfather. In the final scene, Jin Tijin remains imprisoned in a dark dungeon, his arm missing. Despite his dire circumstances, he thinks about his grandson and firmly believes that his grandson is capable of defeating even gods and challenging destiny itself. Watch this next video. See you on the next one.